Uh, welcome to our panel on uh, complicated coalition dynamics, fighting terrorism, and other priorities. My name is Michelle Dunn. I'm a senior associate here in the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, one announcement before we start. We understand that some participants are having trouble accessing Wi-Fi. Our IT team is working on this, but please be aware that if you have a smartphone and if you are more on top of things than I am and you've, you've already updated to iOS 8, you will not be able to connect to Wi-Fi. There's a, there's a problem uh, with that. So, uh, at any rate, why would you need Wi-Fi right now? We've got a fabulous panel for you to, uh, for you to listen to, um, talking about the coalition uh, against uh, ISIS. Uh, we're going to uh, begin at, uh, as we go down the table here. Our first participant is Soli Ozil. He's professor of international relations at Kader Haas University. He's a columnist at Haberturk Daily Newspaper, and he's been an advisor to the chair of TUSIAD in Turkey. Abdelaziz Sagar is chairman and foundation of the Gulf Research Center. Uh, I'm sorry, chairman and founder of the Gulf, Gulf Research Center. He's president of the Sagar Group holding in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is active in the fields of information technology, aviation services, and investments. And this time as a speaker, our own Marwan Moashar, Vice President of Middle East at the Carnegie Endowment. Now, uh, there, there's been a lot of discussion about the coalition partners and the dynamics uh, among them and the dynamics between them and the United States, for example, and how all of this shapes uh, the willingness of the coalition partners to cooperate against the Islamic State. And we welcome comment on that in this panel. But we also want to go a little bit beyond that, a little bit deeper, and look at uh, the domestic developments inside these countries. Because, of course, every country has its own unique situation that it, that it brings to this situation. We want to talk about how uh, each of these countries, how both the governments and the Publics view Daesh, view the Islamic State. What does it mean in the country in question? Does it does it represent a threat? Does it does it receive support? Uh, what kind of threat does it represent? Uh, security, political, cultural, religious, and how do these perceptions shape what the country uh, is willing to do in the coalition against the Islamic State? We'll also perhaps have a little bit to say about the practical military capabilities and limitations of these countries in participating in this coalition. There's also, I think, a little bit of a, an issue of a definitional problem against terrorism. Uh, you'll notice that actually the word terrorism is, is in quotes in this panel title, and that's partly because there may be some differences between the United States and some of its coalition partners, and certainly among the different coalition partners, about what, what defines terrorism, what kind of uh, groups are involved, and so forth. Uh, and we want to ask, you know, will that contradiction prove a serious impediment to cooperation? Can we find common ground in any case? Uh, and just one brief moment of advertisement, I want to point out that my colleague at Carnegie, Fred Wary, and I just authored this policy outlook called the U.S. Arab Counterterrorism Cooperation in a Region Ripe for Extremism. Uh, it's outside on the publications rack. Let's turn first to Turkey uh, solely because it's obviously very much in the news now with Turkey having allowed some at least of the Kurdish Peshmerga through Turkey into Syria. So if you could begin solely with some uh, brief remarks about how you see uh, Turkey's position um, in this conflict and how particularly the, the domestic situation in Turkey shapes what it will and will not be willing to do. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'll try, I'll do my best. Now, as the number of conferences, panels, lectures uh, that I attend increase, I see how helpless, clueless, guideless everyone is, and how everyone actually shares a part of the responsibility in the mess that we collectively find ourselves in in the Middle East. 
not just, not just the great powers, as was implicated in, the, in, a, in a previous question, but also regional actors and regional states, certainly. So uh, given that fact, although I personally am within Turkey, uh, someone fairly critical, actually pretty critical, of, of the government's policies vis-a-vis -vis Syria, and I've been that way for the last, certainly for the last three years at least, I really think that um, there is a projection on Turkey that is not altogether warranted about how responsible Turkey is for a lot of the mess that's around. And I find a lot of the uh, coverage on Turkey quite informative, but a lot of it also really a bit, uh, if not biased, certainly uh, lacking, lacking nuance in, in determining what the, uh, what the issues are or, or giving it the, co the correct interpretation. Now, there is no doubt that Turkey is at best a very reluctant member of this so-called coalition uh, it certainly in terms of what its uh, primary purposes ought to be. And as a result of that, we have seen probably the unprecedented public uh, falling apart of two main partners who keep on uh, correcting one another's statements. If the Americans say, well, Injirlik will be used, the Turks say, no, it will not be used. If the Americans say something will happen, the Turks say something will not happen. Our prime minister, our, our president, I'm sorry, can say one thing, and then the, the next day we learn that because after a phone call with the conversation with President Obama, things have actually changed. The United States was not supposed to be helping PYD. Well, the United States did help the PYD, and quite frankly, in terms of alliance relations, this is a very embarrassing sight. So what one wonders, what is going wrong in terms of the communication that must exist between Turkey, which again is the only country bordering both Iraq and Syria where the, uh, where the Daesh hold a, a big chunk of territory that is also a NATO member with plenty of capabilities, with not necessarily uh, inter intervening militarily, and its, and its major partner, partner, the United States, it is inexplicable to me that they, they have not managed to find a common language or at least a non-embarrassing language in public in order to actually discuss what their, problem, what their problems are. So that leads me to think that there is really a big difference between the way the United States looks at what's going on and what, how Turkey looks at what's going on. And to the best of my Ability, as I see it, obviously Turkey's priorities are very different. When you look at the, uh, uh, at the resolution of the Turkish parliament uh, that was passed, and you look, especially when you read its preamble, it is quite obvious that for the Turkish government, the PKK, the Assad regime, and Daesh are at best equal threats. And some can argue, based on the number of times the PKK and the Assad regime are mentioned, that these two, and particularly the Assad regime, are actually far more significant threats to Turkish security and certainly to, uh, to, uh, to the conditions or to the situation in Iraq, in Iraq and Syria. Um, now, there is no doubt that in the past, when uh, everybody was hot on thinking that Assad would leave like everybody else in a relatively short period of time, the Turkish government did, in a rush, commit some mistakes, made a lot of misjudgments, and it has miscalculated uh, its toleration of very diverse elements uh, going in and out of uh, Syria, using Turkish borders, helping perhaps, helped by uh, certain civil society organizations within Turkey, how this would actually boomerang on it. And I would argue that whatever Turkey's faults might, be, might have been before, uh, it, I think there is now recognition in the security community of the Turkish state that uh, Daesh is indeed a major security threat for the Turkish Republic. Then you may wonder why doesn't Turkey then do more 
whatever more is supposed to mean. And I would argue that probably it is the domestic repercussions of taking a, a, a more openly active part uh, against uh, Daesh that is, that is, uh, that is uh, bothering or that is making the Turkish government hesitant. Because at the end of the day, what I think is happening inside the country is that this uh, general Sunni sentiment that the previous panel had actually uh, presented to us is also being shared by not a very significant part of the Turkish uh, population, but not a non-negligible part of the Turkish population. And although I have not yet seen uh, any uh, poll numbers indicating that we are moving in that direction, uh, there may be a rising halo of sympathy for those who, uh, for, 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 for the Islamic State to the extent that it is being seen under attack by American, uh, by American bombs, by the Westerners or by the Shia. Therefore, uh, I think the, the main concern of the Turkish state in trying to find its proper strategy and proper tactics in dealing with, with the threat of IS is really how to make sure that the uh, non-existing borders between, between the IS outside the country and the IS inside the country, how that can be controlled, whether or not Turkey would be vulnerable to terrorist activities within, within its borders by the IS should its engagement in the, uh, in, in the co among, with the coalition forces be interpreted as terribly inimical. Otherwise, I mean, it, it could not be anything else. And of course, today, uh, we have seen in the pictures, I've, I had to see it in the photographs, how the 160 Peshmerge, mainly KDP Peshmerge, actually have gone through Turkey and, into, and they're going to go into uh, uh, Syria to help the fighters in Kobani. Quite frankly, I have no idea how this is being seen and interpreted in the west of the country. Uh, whether or not the Turkish public in general is sympathetic to what is going on because people in need are going to be helped, or do they see this as an infringement on perhaps even, even, even Turkish sovereignty? I'm sure, the, I, I, am, I mean, I have seen things that the government is under, under, serious, under serious attack. Um, Finally, you've, you've opened, Michel, by suggesting that people, I mean, the parties, different parties' definitions of what terrorism is are different. In that sense, as I said, the uh, Turkish government equates the PKK with the, with, the, with the Islamic State. And indeed, at one point, the president even equated the uh, PYD, which is not on Turkey's terrorist list, with, uh, with, with that because the, P the uh, PYD is an extension of the PKK, in, uh, PKK within Syria. That I'm afraid, or that I think is the general view, way of the view of the Turkish public, and that is what the government has to take into account before it can actually reach a common vocabulary with the US administration. One final note. To the extent that the US position uh, that is, you know, that, like contradicting everything that the Turkish government says, and the fact that uh, yet once more the American uh, American Air Force is bombing a neighboring uh, a neighboring country or a, a population to the extent that this is in that way, I really I really wonder what is happening to the image of the United States again in the country, which has not been very positive in, to begin with, and secondly, whether or not this would lead to a mood change in Turkey where there has been a 19-point increase according to the German Marshall Fund's transatlantic trend survey in favor of NATO and whether or not this would actually diminish that recently found love after a long period of decline for NATO in the, in the, in the general, among the general public. Thank you very much, Soli. Uh, we'll turn now to you, uh, Abdulaziz, uh, to discuss Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states. I realize these, these are all not one block, so we really appreciate the extent to which you can kind of disaggregate the positions 
um, of the governments and populations in the various Gulf countries, uh, as well as Saudi Arabia, as they look at the Daesh threat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be in this panel, and great to be back to Washington. The Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan have resulted to Al-Qaeda. Did the U.S. liberation, some they call it liberation, some they call it invasion of Iraq, resulted of Daesh? That's what we have to question. The unfinished job that the U.S. have left in Iraq, did that result to something like this? Is the policy of isolation, is the uh, uh, isolation policy that Maliki have adopted, who was fully supported by Iraq, have created something like Daesh. 2003, Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi, he said, I'm no longer part of Al-Qaeda, I'm independent, my objective is different, and I'm going to fight. So it did not start today. 2003, that was the, the root of Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi, who was killed, and then we had Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and then 2006, we had the first announcement of the Dawlat al-Iraq al-Islamiyya. So it was Iraq focus and not Iraq and Syria in 2006. So there is some, some roots before we reach to 2013 uh, where the announcement of Daesh, which is uh, the ISIS, as you call it, Shaman Iraq uh, state. So, you know, giving that little bit background, saying that it's not today, but why today we are alert and why the creation of, of, of Daesh and what was the target for that one. I think a long <coughs> depriving isolation, the Sunni in Iraq, falling too much in the hands of Iran, handing over Iraq to Iran, having the severe and the massive Iranian influence with the sectarian dimension Iraq have definitely led to a situation like what we see today in Iraq. Also in Syria, you know, we've heard so many red lines, we've heard so many policy from the U.S., the U.S., they were reluctant in that one. We understand the interests of Israel in the region there quite well, and we understand the importance of the chemical uh, issue. But at the same time, after all of that, still... The moderate Syrian, if they were supported at the right time, you know, Saudi Arabia, it, it was in August 2012 when King Abdullah wrote a letter to the Syrian nation. Why he did it and why that time? Because we took all the time to softly negotiate with Bashar al-Assad to stop it, to, uh, uh, not to continue in doing what he's doing. But after using massive violence, after uh, uh, the resentment and the resistance were m much more spread, after we had a, a, a United Nations resolution there. Then the Saudi tried to push more and interfere more in the issue of supporting the moderate Syrian opposition. Now, remember, there was no Syrian opposition historically. You know, they were all under a very strong regime that nobody can talk. They control everybody. And just a year before that, in 2010, I remember there was a delegation visiting Washington here trying to nominate who is the new ambassador. So it was a relatively speaking nice relation. King Abdullah visited Syria. He took, you know, Bashar al-Assad to Lebanon. So, you know, there was all this sort of nice, you know, sort of relation. But we reached to the point where start using massive aggression against people, spreading UN resolution, Saudi Arabia came and stood very clearly. And I was the one maybe who said it publicly in TV that I said, I feel sorry that we have not gave our condolence and our clear position to our Syrian friend even prior to that. Now, did Daesh ever said anything about Saudi Arabia? Go back to the, all their literature. They never mentioned a threat to Saudi Arabia. Why is that? Because they focus in Iraq and Syria. That this is their territorial uh, interest there. But did the Saudi, uh, ha, for, for instance, have, have we received any operational inside uh, uh, Saudi Arabia by Daesh, like what happened in Jordan in 2005 or what happened in Syria or what happened in Lebanon? No. Why? Because first the distance, second. Now, finally, ultimately, they will reach to the Arabian Peninsula. They will go to the Gulf, but first they want to focus their operational and achievement in a specific AC territory there. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia being accused of supporting Daesh, I wish somebody would really give a sort of uh, Daesh. <laughs> the, uh, Daesh is the abbreviation of the ISIS. This is the Arabic, uh, uh, you know, acronym of that one. So it's the uh, uh, the Arabic translation of the ISIS. Sorry. Uh, so. 
Saudi Arabia issued two things. One, they tried to say, look, at, if you want to come back to your country, we know how many Saudi there have been there. At least the government have tried to figure out how many Saudi uh, went and joined them. They said, well, listen, go back to the embassy in Istanbul, so, you know, hand over yourself. You will have a fair treatment. But then we issue a sort of, uh, 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 first, the list that we have identified the terrorist list. The second said, well, you have, you know, 30 days or 60 days. If you come, if you deliver yourself to the embassy, then we, you will have a fair trial. You will not be so. And then we put up all the laws and regulation there. And second, if you really look at uh, the ISIS, there was no uh, uh, leadership in ISIS from Saudi Arabia. Yes, there's a participant from Saudi Arabia. We have people also from Bahrain and some other Gulf country there. But the percentage, if you look at the majority, was from North Africa. I mean, you have the Chinese Islamic Salafist now operation there, and the, the Chinese are mad about it. How come? You know, we love the, the keen buck, I mean, the, the, uh, the keen duck and the spring rolls, but not to be part of the ISIS, you know. <laughs> so, so the Chinese have a problem, the Germans have a problem, the European, the American, everybody started having a problem, but the big bulk number came from North Africa. And there was no leadership in managing. There's, yes, a suiciders. There's a soldiers on the foot on the ground. But apparently on Daesh there was. Unlike Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, they targeted Saudi Arabia. They targeted the Gulf state. They clearly made it. They moved their operation out from Saudi Arabia to Yemen to re-enhance and, and get their act together to be able to launch whatever they can against Saudi Arabia and the, 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 you know, the rest of the Gulf countries. Why did we participate on the coalition? I think it's a very important question. Number one, there was no legitimacy of this coalition without Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf country participating. It had to take our mufti to come out clearly and issue the fatwa, Islamic fatwa, saying fighting da Daesh is not part of Islam, what they're doing is wrong, and they deserve to be fought and, 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 and taking all the necessary action. So we have a religious fatwa from the mufti of Saudi Arabia, and the Saudi Arabia participation gave legitimacy to this coalition that for the first time maybe in history you have this huge number of countries acting, working together, fighting an unstate actor that was created as a, as a result of a failing state in Iraq, as a result of an unfinished job, as a result of a sectarian government that have taken a side and, and, and create a, 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 a political platform or a platform that allows such a thing to grow there. So uh, the, the, uh, the second point... Uh, on, on uh, Mosul, what happened in Mosul, it was a, you know, a big mysterious story. How comes a small non-state actors group, even if there are 20 or 30,000 you know, people, take over a city like Mosul? And to what we are hearing today, we are hearing that we need to train, we need a three years job, we need to spend billions of dollars before we get into the liberation of the second biggest city in Iraq. I mean, you know, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, worries a lot of us uh, there in looking at it. But in, in, uh, uh, on the participation, first we had to show that this is our strong allies, the United States of America. We will participate with it, and we will go into war with it, as they have done before in liberating Kuwait, and they have done a good things for us in the region. Reciprocity, this is strong alliances. We both agree in fighting terrorism, so we will do that one. If we need to support this coalition by providing airspace, uh, flyover, bases, logistic, some financial contribution, I'm sure the Gulf country will be more than happy to enter into this one. But as a result of that, we became in the list of Daesh. You know, before we were not part of Daesh targeted list. As a result of the coalition, we became part of Daesh wanted list. The Gulf countries, since they became, since they, you know, their uh, pilot uh, boys and girls flew, uh, you know, to kill or to or to, uh, you know, dismantle some of the facility of Daesh, we became wanted by 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 da by the ISIS Daesh. Sorry for the, you know, but it's the same word I explained. So, uh, you know, they became a target now for that, and at the same time. Uh, uh, the threat extended now from an isolated area in the north part of Iraq, close to that one, to the Gulf countries now as a result of what we are uh, hoping to do. Where do we stand on our Turkish friend uh, uh, position? I think we could have taken Turkey position not to sign to be part of the coalition and not to send our boys and girls to fight. But at the same time, we decided, no, we will go full-fledged with our American friend. We appreciate the, you know, the lead of the U.S., the coalition that they have put up together. Am I somebody like me? How do I look at the new National Guard 
you know, phenomena established in the Sunni area, I think what my worries is very simple. We're going to have the Shia militia, Bashmarga in Kurdistan, Sunni uh, National Guard in some places. If they are equipped, then God knows what may happen between the three. Is that a prescription for separation? You know, you call it federation, we call it separation, because the United States is a federal, Canada is a federal, but for us, uh, uh, separation will take place based on sectarianism and on uh, uh, ethnicity. So that will be the future problem that what we may anticipate on Iraq. But our Turkish friend, I think we agree with them on having no-fly zone, second, uh, having a safe zone for the refugees, and third, uh, uh, train the Syrian, uh, you know, and make sure that enough training will be given to the Free Army of Syria and the decent, acceptable opposition to equip them and to enhance them, and at the same time targeted the Syrian government because it's one of the causes with the Syrian government. I mean, it's so funny to look at how much the world is concerned about Ain al-Arab in Arabic. We call it, you call it uh, uh, Kobani. Uh, and at the same time, Bashar still killed 300,000 people, millions of refugees, and uh, uh, the country was destroyed for many, many, many years to come, but yet nobody wants to get rid of al-Assad. We thought all the red line was put by the U.S. administration will be fulfilled. We were happy to see some serious engagement. I think today with the new coalition, with the new act together, with the new walking together, yes, we all have agreed that we have a common threat that we need to fight and to go for it. Uh, in a simple word, yes, Daesh does represent a future threat, maybe not a immediate instant threat, you know, for the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. But yes, it is a future threat if they succeed, if they continue, if they expand, if uh, they d defined us as part of the coalition against them, then definitely we become a target on that one. I think it's extremely important to have the act together and to, and, and, and to fight our common enemy together. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Abdelaziz. Uh, and now, Marwan, your turn to address how this looks from Jordan. I will thank you, Michelle. I will try to address uh, both aspects. How, uh, you know, the title of the session is Fighting Terrorism and Other Priorities, and it implies that there are other priorities for countries of the region. In fact, there are none. Uh, so fighting terrorism so far is limited to fighting Daesh uh, militarily, even while uh, countries of the region acknowledge that the problem of Daesh did not evolve overnight and that there are non-military reasons why Daesh uh, is today uh, so strong. But let me focus first on uh, Jordan and its part in the coalition. It's interesting that uh, Jordan today uh, is a willing participant in the coalition. It was not cajoled into participating. The king has made it very clear that this is a cultural war, that this is a war within Islam for the real values of Islam, and as such, the Jordan is going to participate full force in it. And uh, 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 not only that, but he actually made it clear that his preference uh, would be that it would be led by countries of the region and not led uh, by the United States. Uh, and so a very forceful position when it comes to fighting Daesh militarily. And Jordan, even though it's a small country, on the military front can actually provide a lot of uh, support to the coalition in three main areas. Logistical support, you know, the coalition is already uh, using air bases, particularly in the north of the country. Intelligence support, the uh, Jordanians have a very strong intelligence services and they have, uh, they have infiltrated uh, Al-Qaeda and, and uh, ISIS and continue to do so. And I think that the intelligence support is going to be crucial in this campaign. And then the third support is going to come in terms of uh, the network of contacts that the Jordanians have with the Sunni tribes in Iraq in particular. <coughs> Abadi, the uh, for, uh, you know, Iraqi prime minister, was in Jordan two days ago, and Jordan arranged for him to meet with the tribal Sunni uh, chiefs, uh, in which they pledged support, not all of them, of course, they pledged support for the uh, effort uh, uh, against ISIS. So, in these fronts, uh, Jordan can provide a lot of uh, a lot of support to the coalition. But does ISIS pose a military threat uh, to Jordan? I don't. I don't think so. 
Uh, I don't think so because, as many have said before me, ISIS has been uh, successful where it operated in Sunni areas that felt marginalized, that felt frustrated, both in Syria and Iraq, that had grievances with their government in a failed state environment. Where you have failed states in, 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 in Syria and Iraq, ISIS has been strong. ISIS has not yet won a major war against non-Sunni areas. Uh, even in Ain al-Arab, Kobani, or otherwise, it has not won one single war. And I don't think that ISIS is going to attack Jordan across desert land, both in Syria and Iraq, uh, against a very strong uh, Jordanian army. Uh, I don't see that happening, and I don't think uh, that is going uh, to be the case. But ISIS, having said that, on the military front, I think poses other non-military threats, not just to Jordan, but to the whole region. And it is in this area that my concern is that not much is being done to address these non-military aspects of the situation. One, ISIS has, I mean, in terms of numbers, just to give you some numbers, uh, in terms of core support for ISIS in, in the country, uh, most analysts that I respect uh, estimate the core support of the group in Jordan to be around 5,000 people. Of these, around 1,500 are already participating in... Uh, in uh, this is a very, you know, of course, approximate number. Who knows what the real number is? But I don't expect, in terms of core support, die-hard ideological support in the country, I don't think extends beyond 5,000. However... Having said that, ISIS is becoming a rallying point against the establishment. So you talk to people, and they, anybody who has grievances, not anybody, but some people who have grievances against the government, not just in Jordan, but across the Arab world, is using ISIS as a rallying point against the establishment. This is very clear to me in many, uh, uh, many uh, aspects. Uh, just as an anecdote, uh, a few weeks ago we had a problem in uh, downtown Amman where illegal vendors were setting up their shop and selling uh, their goods and blocking traffic illegally. And so when the municipality uh, 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 attempted to talk to them, offered them alternative places, uh, and then uh, uh, eventually trying to remove them from these, uh, uh, you know, from these uh, illegal places, they start shouting ISIS slogans. It is an issue that has nothing to do, okay, <laughs> with ISIS. But it, ISIS is becoming a, a sort of a counterforce to the establishment in many places in the Arab world, and that is uh, worrisome. I talk to a lot of people uh, since I've uh, been back in the country, particularly from the new generation where unemployment in Jordan and in many countries around the area is over 30% among the youth. You talk to them and they clearly tell you, this is not our war. Uh, we, they don't see it as a cultural war. They don't see it as a war for values. They see it as an American war you know, against the region. And if it is an American war against the region, they're not going to side with the Americans. And that's something that is also uh, uh, worrisome uh, in my view. ISIS has certainly hurt the reform agenda, not just in Jordan, but across the Arab world. Uh, you talk reform now, and many people will tell you, certainly the government will tell you, this is not the time. Okay, to talk about reform. We need to worry about this military threat. And so we are back to a, what I call a pre-Arab uprising security mode, where people are focused on one thing and one thing only, which is security. Of course, they tend to forget that the end of that road <laughs> was an Arab uprising. But nobody seems to be thinking along these lines, and everybody is back to the security mode where what we need to do now is to attack ISIS militarily, finish them off. We then have plenty of time uh, to worry about the other aspects. Uh, and that, that, that's an argument that, uh, that concerns me as well. I mean, I agree totally that ISIS needs to be addressed militarily. But as many people have said, 
And even as governments in the region have also said that the reason ISIS has evolved in such a quick manner is because of the exclusionary policies of some governments in the region. Everybody talks about how Maliki, accurately so, excluded the Sunnis from uh, uh, the political uh, game in uh, Iraq. Everybody talks about how Assad excluded you know, everybody else from the political game in Syria. But while people understand that exclusion leads to radical forces such as ISIS, are they trying to do anything about it? In other words, are governments of the region trying to change course and adopt more inclusionist policies so that you do not reach uh, uh, the, the result of ISIS? None whatsoever. Everybody, again, is in a security mode, as I said, and whereas people understand and accurately diagnose the problem, nobody yet is doing or trying to do anything about the solution. That's the real issue and the real concern, in my view, over the long term. ISIS will be defeated militarily. Okay? They will not be able to expand beyond, I think, uh, what they have done uh, so far. But that's not the real threat. The real threat is to leave unaddressed an, a number of educational, political, and economic policies that have led to the evolution of people like ISIS. We talk about an educational system that has failed in teaching people about inclusion and diversity and pluralism and respect for the other. Is any effort being done in any Arab country to have a, you know, a, a fresh look at the educational uh, policies of these countries? None whatsoever. We talk about the loss of opportunity, of economic opportunity for people, which is leading many, particularly in the young generation, to flock to ISIS, not necessarily because they agree with, their, with, with its ideology, but because they lack economic opportunity and they find in ISIS a way uh, to address their economic needs. Are things being done to spur growth and, and, and you know, adopt economic policies that, are, that, that move away from the rentier system that has plagued the Arab world for the longest period of time? None of that is being done. And certainly in the political atmosphere, whereas... Uh, there are clear examples, Tunisia is the latest, two, years, two days ago, of what inclusionist policies can lead to in terms of stability and in terms of moving ahead in a, in a, in a rather smooth manner, and what exclusionist policies can lead to in Syria and Iraq and Egypt and elsewhere, despite the clear record of the last three years or four years of Arab uprisings, these huge wake-up calls, first the Arab uprising and second the uh, uh, evolution of ISIS, in my uh, uh, view, have not yet been internalized fully, and the region uh, is still talking about military solutions. To be fair, neither the region nor the, the West, and particularly the U.S., have been good at non-military solutions anyway. It is easy to send armies to defeat people. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world. But it's far more difficult to have a serious look, even over time, at the underlying causes uh, that lead to the evolution of these forces. Neither Arab governments nor the U.S. Uh, have been good at this, and, and, and I would argue uh, not much has been done anyway uh, in these uh, two areas. Let me stop here. And, uh, Thank you, Marwan. Uh, I believe Soli wanted to make a, a, a brief follow-up remark. I mean, I almost telegraphically spoke. I, won't, I will not abuse your tolerance for me. I just wanted to add three things. One, in the, uh, in the uh, previous panel, we had four experts. Mr. Koi said that he expected ISIS to basically break up whereas uh, Joseph Bahut and Yezid Saik basically said that it would be durable. And if experts whose daily lives are consumed studying ISIS, we obviously cannot make up our minds as to exactly what's going on. And that really makes anal not just analysis, 
but the kind of prognosis that Marwan has also suggested very difficult to come by, particularly with a Western world that is in deep crisis and all the other two major powers, Russia wanting to be a game breaker and China just not willing to do anything positive, number one. Number two, Kobani. Kobani is becoming something much more important than it could ever be, let's say, three months ago or four months ago, on several counts. On the Turkish issue, it is true in my judgment that the Turkish government thought it would be really a good idea for IS and the PKK PYD forces to actually tear each other down or wear each other down. And ultimately, the United States did use air force, the air power, in order not to allow Kobani to fall. That is exactly what it had done when IS started to move towards Erbil. That is, the Kurdish region was protected, which gives a sense, and I think Abdulaziz Sagar at least implied it, if not explicitly said it, that from, a, from the region's population's perspective, if there is just a single, just one clear American policy, because American policy has been anything but clear or consistent, that is, we will not let the Kurds be beaten up by any of the other forces that surround them. That doesn't bother me particularly at all. But if this is the perception, then the question that he raised, well, what about 250,000 people who have been killed? And that, remember, it was President Obama, I think, in the 6th or 7th of January 2013, I'm sorry, 2009, who said to Newsweek, could someone please explain to me why the lives of 120,000 Syrians are more important than the lives of 3.5 million Congolese who have been killed? And if you start asking those questions and you cannot answer that vis-a-vis -vis Arab deaths and, and Kurdish deaths or what you do for the Kurds and you don't do for the Arabs, that really complicates diplomacy for all concern. That does not absolve, last my last, last sentence, that does not absolve any of the regional actors, the Turkish state included, from their responsibility in the bloody mess that we find ourselves in. But if, if this is going to be where major issues of the world are going to be discussed, I really think one ought to look at those from a not strictly uh, American perspective, but a larger one. Uh, Sully, I want to ask uh, you and Abdulaziz a follow-up question. I, I have one for you too, Marwan, but a different one. And, um, and, and you've, you've bridged to it nicely. I mean, first of all, I want to ask whether uh, Turkey and, let's say, Saudi Arabia, although we can also ask this about other Gulf states, are they participating in, in the coalition to the extent they are, primarily because they, they want to use it as a bridge to uh, get the United States and other international powers to address the problem of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, right? Is that, is that the primary strategy? And I, I would also like to ask you to say something, uh, both of you, but particularly you, Abdulaziz, from the point of view of Saudi Arabia, up to Marwan's point about youth grievances, uh, and, uh, you know, we, you've got a tremendous youth bulge in the region, um, even even in a wealthy country like Saudi Arabia, there's there's youth unemployment, underemployment, uh, lack of match up with the opportunities in the economy, and so forth. To what extent do you think uh, decision makers in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf look at the problem at Daesh? Do they make the connection that Marwan is making that maybe we need to do something to address youth grievances so that they are they will not be susceptible uh, to the lure of groups like like the uh, like ISIS, like Daesh? Well, for sure, when Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf countries supported the coalition, there was, uh, amongst all the other issues that I've mentioned, I think there was two, uh, two points which is very important. Number one, uh, we were hoping that this may lead the U.S. to believe that getting rid of Bashar al-Assad or fighting the Syrian regime is extremely important, and this will give us a better success in there. Uh, if not, at least we were hoping that Al-Assad will make a mistake and get his plane to fire, and then the U.S. would have to respond. Unfortunately, none of these two have it. So this, again, is the big question is, did the coalition of uh, um, airstrike uh, achieve its target? Yes, it may help a little bit in, in uh, 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 
containing, destroying some of the facility, getting rid of some, but is it going to achieve? I think if I go back to the um, eight or nine security back in Iraq that General David Petraeus at that time in Iraq implies when he used the Sahawat, uh, the Iraqi have a bad history with the American, the Iraqi Sunni I'm talking about. In Sahawat, there was 12,000 Iraqi uh, at that time being heavily involved in Sahawat in trying to fight Al-Qaeda. As a result of that, nobody took care of them. They were left, they were killed. They were abused, their family was destroyed, uh, and then this is a result of a Maliki. So the, the Sunni Iraqi, they don't trust that the American, nor the Maliki government. Maliki, by the way, did not disappear. He just used a different position. And, and unfortunately, today, Abadi has a very tough uh, job to prove himself away from Maliki and away from the previous policies and say, well, I'm independent. I'm going to look at issues. I'm not going to use the sectarian dimension. This is why he tried to send a positive signal to the region, particularly to Saudi Arabia. But we need his promises and war to be converted to reality. On the other issue where Marwan mentioned, I think, yes, we do agree that we have problems. We have issues like many of the country. We are not the only country who has an unemployment issue. But of course, being a guaranteed state since many, many years, as uh, Dr. Marwan mentioned, people have given, give, you know, they gave up their political right in reward for the economic benefit that they've had. Today, they're asking, where is the benefit? Today, they want to have housing, they want to have job, they want to have many, only in this country, you have 120,000 Saudi students studying here. So all these people, when they come back with higher education, they want to make sure that there is a job assurance. So again, uh, if you go through the analysis of the number of people that went from Saudi Arabia, joined uh, uh, the ISIS, uh, you look at the, the age group, you look at the profession, the background, do they really have a job? I mean, I was surprised to see from one family, 12 persons have joined uh, there. So it means not necessarily only the job issue and the, and the, and the economic situation, but it's beyond that. It's the fear that there is unfair, injustice, the, you know, the feeling of, 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 of somebody uh, you know, gave up uh, uh, support, uh, a government that has an, uh, an isolation policies. You know. All what have happened, you need to compile it together. So this is why if you want to fight uh, the ISIS today in Iraq, you need to go back to the Sunni zones. You need to talk to them. You need to give them a comfort. You need to assure them they will not be isolated. They will not be pushed out of the government. They will have equal opportunity. Their, their people in the prison will be released from the Maliki government that he put them there all. The Iran influence that, uh, 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 as Prince Saud al-Faisal, the former minister of Saudi Arabia in the Council of Foreign Relations said, well, you know, the United States, thanks to their policy, handed over Iraq in a golden plate to, to, to Iran. So we need to make sure that Iran containment in interfering in Iraq issues, the mosaic of Iraq, definitely Saudi Arabia position is very clear. We are with the unity of Iraq. We do not wish to see a fragmented, segmented, divided Iraq. And here, by the way, it's a similar interest of Iran. Iran would like to see a unified Iraq, but ruled by the Shia, by the, uh, uh, you know, their own people, their own puppets that they would like to have. On the Kurdish issue, I'll just mention one, one minor issue. Yes, we were not happy to see Germany or other country equipping the Bishmarga with additional equipment because they occupy Kirkuk, and Kirkuk still there is a big debate of that city. The Arab consider it it's, uh, it's, it's an Arab city. The Kurd still think there's a majority of the Kurdish, but they will use that force, they will use this occasion, they will use the support of the U.S., to make sure, uh, 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 you know, to, to do the referendum as fast as possible under the Bishmarga control to make it a Kurdish city. Uh, it has oil, mobile oil have signed a contract, we understand that, but, you know, I think we're playing with fire here. When we use economic interest, when we use the, uh, uh, you know, a city which is uh, considered to be an Arab city, give it to the Kurd, not dealing with the issue quite since I think... ISIS honestly target is not Saudi Arabia, is not the Gulf. ISIS target is United States of America and Iran. This is the two because somehow they see strong alliances between this, the two over Iraq. Thank you. But there, but there was also, I mean, there was a, there was, the, you know, you blame the United States for having believed perhaps that the Syria conflict was containable, and it has obviously uh, metastasized in the region to something far longer, or far larger. But but now you're speaking of the. Islamic State as if it is containable and not really a problem. But it can for be it. No, it can be contained if you gain back the Sunni. 
If you uh -huh. gain back the Sunni and you give them the trust, the belief, the, I mean, 12,000 people, as I told you, they joined David Petraeus in the war against Al-Qaeda. They fought with him. They were left out, no salary, no job, nothing like this. And all the Shia militia, they were appointed in the defense department, on the security department. So how, how would you consider, how, how can you not blame them for not trusting both sides? Thank you. Sally, I do kind you of differ because quite, fr I mean, I, mean I, 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 I do think that there's been a, quite a number of uh, serious and very consequential failures on the part of American foreign policy making in, in that particular issue. But I also think that the regional, the states of the region have utterly, utterly failed to actually come up with any kind of constructive solution to a problem when the United States was not around. And at the end of the day, everybody wanted the United States to come and use the Air Force so that everybody could have an alibi and presumably also work. So without solving the Iran-Saudi uh, Arabia geopolitical game, through the, which is being fought through sectarian uh, hatred, I really don't think we can get anywhere. Without engaging, without engaging the Russians in a, in a peace process, I really don't think we can get anywhere. Uh, so if we could just face those realities and then move on, I think we'd be better off. Uh, okay. Now just a quick question for you, Marwan, and then we're going to open up to questions from our participants here. Marwan, you, you were talking, uh, you sort of contrasted uh, Tunisia with the rest of the region in terms of, uh, you know, the, the democratic process moving forward there uh, as opposed to the rest of the region and so forth. But there was this interesting article in the Washington Post today about uh, the large number of recruits to ISIS from Tunisia and talking about uh, about actions, repression against Salafis there following terrorist attacks inside of Tunisia. So how do you take this apart? I mean, uh, inclusion is important, youth engagement is important, uh, but it's a complicated matter in these polarized societies. And we see that this country, even with its promising young democracy, um, has, has still had a problem of radicalization of youth. Could you address that? I mean, Tunisia, uh, uh what is happening in Tunisia does not suggest that they are a perfect, ideal, uh, fully functioning democracy, and they still have real problems and will continue to have real problems for a while. I'm not sure I can explain why, on one hand, they have this large number of fighters. The Tunisians that I know tell me that uh, uh, after the revolution, a lot of uh, people were released from prison. Some were uh, you know, legitimate political prisoners. Others were just uh, uh, thugs. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not one to, to, uh, to judge that. What I, uh, when I keep uh, referring to Tunisia, it's because I think the Arab world uh, today uh, should be engaged in a war of values, not a war between, you know, secular and religious elements, not a war between. It's a war of values. And in that respect, Tunisia has shown the Arab world despite, you know, everything we can say about its unique characteristics, etc. But it has shown the Arab world that Islam and democracy can coexist, that democracy does work in the Arab world, that performance now is starting to trump ideology in the Arab world. The traditional wisdom in the Arab world was that people, you know, vote according to ideology, either because they're Islamists or because they are Pan-Arabists or because they are Nasserists, etc., one very important, I think, result from the Tunisian election, which took place two days, is that all three parties that formed the Troika, okay, lost in the last election. Uh, An Nahda went down from 38% to about 20% now, they're saying. Uh, uh, Mar Marzouki's party, CFR, uh, went down to 1%. 0.5%, and at Tekatul, Mustafa bin Jafar's party never even uh, no, showed up uh, in the results. What is that telling you? That people want results. And if people, you know, do not see results, they're not going to cast their vote blindly just because it's an Islamist party or just because it's a party they... they and, and who was the party that won? A new party, not necessarily progressive, led by an 86-year-old man, formed only two years after, you know, uh, the revolution, right? 
and it was able to defeat the largest Islamist and organized party in the country, which has been operating since 1981. The message is clear. From now on, performance is going to uh, Trump ideology. This is the war of values, I think, that need to be fought in the Arab world, and it's not being fought. I mean, other than Tunisia, we have very few countries, if any, that understand that the real, uh, the real battle is a battle for pluralism and for inclusion and not a battle between secular and religious elements. Thank you. Uh, we'll open now to questions from the audience. Please put up your hand and wait for the microphone. And please let us know who you are before you ask your question. Yes, Mona Shakaki with Al Arabiya TV. So, um, following up on Marwan's answer, um, there's been a crackdown um, on a lot of the perhaps legitimate political Islam, uh, whether it's the Brotherhood in Egypt or um, Islamic uh, groups elsewhere, um, as part of this whole crackdown on ISIS is the Brotherhood is Hamas is all of these you know other kind of groups. So I was just wondering, um, especially Sayyid Sagar, uh, if you could tell us more, where do you see these um, legitimate political Islamic groups um, going uh, during this time. Marwan was talking about how in Tunisia they've had this test and now you know they're perhaps failing in certain aspects of it, but they really haven't been able to test them anywhere else in, in uh, the Arab world. So where do you see that going? Thank you. We'll take a couple of other questions at the same time. Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I, I'm not an ex, I'm just a, an amateur at this, but it's a very interesting area. Um, my question is for the gentleman from Turkey. Um, why are the Turks so concerned about Assad? Um, he's, he, Turkey is a big country, it's part of NATO, it's, it's relatively wealthy, Syria is a smaller country, um, and so on. Um, and if Bashar was to re, be replaced now, it would probably be by ISIS. They're the most powerful other force in the country. Uh, one more right here. Lady with the... Uh, okay. Yes, thank you. Anushua Ray from Senator Barney Sanders' office. Um, thank you, Marwan, for bringing up non-military solutions because I thought that it was really vital and don't get to hear a lot of that. My question is about another point that you briefly mentioned about how some youth look at this war as America's war, and maybe that is one of the reasons why the coalition and the fact that it has to be successful is very imperative. But um, given the historic tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran um, and how different stakeholders also are looking at different end games in the region. Is there any common ground uh, for the coalition to function on? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's um, then let's start with the first question. Let's start with you, uh, Abdelaziz, on the question on political Islamists, particularly the Brotherhood, and then the, the other speakers may uh, like to comment on this as well. Mona, we used to see you in TV alone, but nice to see you today here. <laughs> Uh, Muna, she does a great job reporting from Washington Arabia, so those, uh, the one who receive the news in Arabic in our part of the world see Muna every day on screen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, political Islam, are we witnessing end of it? I'm not so sure. I think still there is a great um, uh, interest in many countries, of course, and there are many different groups. Should we treat them equal? I'm not so sure. <laughs> in other words, uh, the key issue is those whom they use violence as a means to achieve their political game. Uh, this is what we should be against. Uh, but Morocco gave a different example. Muslim Brotherhood, they are on the uh, government. Uh, they are participating in Tunis. Al-Islah in Yemen, they were part of the equation, but then they've been shifted. I think Egypt was the biggest concern because Egypt, uh, uh, at least from a Gulf perspective point of view and majority of the Gulf countries, so that to have a big country like Egypt with its resources, military, power, regional uh, importance, to fall into a certain group, very idealistic, using ideology as a means in ruling and, and, and running the country, that was a big threat being perceived from our part of the world. Should we treat everyone equal? I think I'll go back to the equation. If anybody use violence as a means, we should fight it. We should not allow extremist group 
you know, you should, you know, any sort of belief you have, it's your own right to believe. Again, this has led, of course, to the big deviation in the Gulf region between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain, and UAE, is the whole issue of Muslim brother in Egypt. This is the key issue. The way how Qatar basically decided that political Islam is winning, they're going to be in power, let me bank on those. They exist, this operation, in 72 countries. They have 100 years oper- I mean, uh, history, so I want to bank on that. Is it the right uh, bet or a wrong bet? I think themselves they can judge on that one. But somehow, until today, the reason why we, have, we don't have the ambassador back in, f- from the Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, back into Doha is because still the uh, firm Qatar position in support of the Muslim Brotherhood and the way how they see it and the way how they brought it closely between them and Turkey in support of those groups. Again, from, from our perspective, as I said, it's been used differently. Saudi Arabia issue a list and included in that list uh, Hezbollah in Saudi Arabia, but not Hezbollah in Lebanon, which was surprisingly. You know, it includes Nusra, it includes uh, Daesh, it includes Muslim Brother, of course, uh, uh, you know, group. But I think we differentiate today between those in Muslim Brother whom they is just a matter of a belief or a political means. So I think, you know, there is a difference today uh, in that one. Uh, but I can say one thing, of course, we're not going to see the end of political Islam. It will revive, it will have a different shape. It's like what I mentioned before, Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi gave a tawheed wal jihad as a name, and then they moved, to, they changed names and they changed identity sometimes, but not necessarily change the belief and the approach. Sorry? Yeah. Just one thing about... But the thing is, the, the important thing, I suppose, is that it remained political Islam, because what we're seeing is actually negation of all politics. In a way. Uh, and, and, and so uh, on the uh, Assad issue, I really think that the, um, it was wrong on the part of the Turkish government not to let, n- n- to have really g- done away with all the uh, reservations between itself and the Assad regime prior to 2011. And I think... It is, it is not morally wrong, but I think it is unrealistic for it to demand that this be a priority for everyone else. On the other hand, based on what the other panel said, and to the extent that I follow the American debate, nobody can really stomach letting him stay in place either. But nobody really knows how to move him out without creating a state collapse, and God knows we have enough collapsed states. We really don't need another one. And it is also, in my judgment, true that the Turkish government would have preferred from basically August 2011 onwards, but even before then perhaps, to have a Muslim Brotherhood-type politician to replace Bashar al-Assad. I still think this is what they want. I just don't know if there are any, quote-unquote, moderates left who can actually pull things together politically in that country. Uh, Marwan, these questions and then also the questions specifically for you. Well, let's agree first that political Islam cannot be used as a monolithic term. It's not, political Islam is not monolithic. ISIS, Al-Qaeda on the extreme are different from Hamas and Hezbollah in the middle, maybe, of political Islam. And then are different from the Muslim Brotherhood. And then within the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, Al-Nahda is different from uh, 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 the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, is different from the Moroccan different Muslim Brotherhood, is different from the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood. So, so that's the first uh, broad point I want to make. Second, I will agree with Abdul Aziz. Those who, lose, those who use violence lose their right to be participants in the political process. But then we have to complete the sentence. Those who don't have the right to be included in the political process. And it's interesting that in the Arab world, the, the big now sort of campaign is against those who don't use violence is against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, is against the, those who do use violence and have used violence in the past. We haven't seen such a campaign in the past uh, in the same vigor uh, that we have seen it here. My point is, once you, once, you ex- once you accept the principle of excluding others from the political process because you don't agree with their views, you in the same breath allow them to exclude you when they come to, come to power. So selective democracy is no democracy. That's my main point, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with political Islam. Again, we go back to Tunisia. What Tunisians have done yesterday is historic. 
And it's historic in more than way, one way, but one important way in which it was historic is that it was the first time in the Arab world, probably in the world, I don't want to make that assumption, but probably in the world, where an Islamic party wins and loses an election by the ballot box and seeds defeat by the ballot box. So those who uh, uh, have argued in the Arab world that the nature of Islamic parties is such that when they come to power, they will never leave. That argument today is undermined by the fact that you do have an Islamic party which did come to power and which ceded the, you know, power uh, according to the ballot box. Again, people will argue Tunisia is different. Maybe. But if an Islamist party can do it in Tunisia, there is no reason why they cannot do it elsewhere in the Arab world. On the issue of uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, I don't see uh, why the Saudis and the Iranians will, cannot, uh, cannot uh, cooperate on ISIS, for example. That does not mean that they're going to see eye to eye on all issues, and certainly they won't, and certainly there's a lot of Differences over Iran, over the Sunni Shiite issue, over the nuclear issue, over security, etc. Uh, but we've seen stranger uh, bedfellows before uh, when it came to certain uh, issues, and I don't see why uh, they, 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 I'm not saying they will, but I don't see why they won't cooperate uh, on ISIS uh, in a limited manner that will not extend to other issues. Why Iran was not included, despite the invitation of the Secretary uh, of State Department here, I think is very simple. Iran refused to consider Syria as part of the base for uh, Daesh to be, uh, uh, you know, to attack if they are in Syria. And second, they do not have an air force capability, can join the same coalition. So what they have is an old equipment, old air force, cannot join with such thing. Can they participate in the ground support? I think they are part of the problem and not part of the solution. It's Iran who really be part of the world. I mean, Daesh target, basically, it's Iran, number one, and then U.S. number two. If Iran did not interfere in Iraq to that extent that have created the sectarianism issues in such a way, so they cannot really, uh, uh, you know, they can help, they can maybe provide something, they can give, but this, at the same time, today in Iran, they feel Daesh have given them more credibility, Daesh have gave the uh, Muslim Shia uh, a better perspective than the Sunni Muslim uh, in that world. So it, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> the next panel is going to focus on Iran in a lot more detail. But w would you also say, though, that Iran having withdrawn support from Maliki was crucial in terms of moving the political process forward inside of Iraq? Maliki visited Washington three times. He was supported twice by the U.S. to re-win the election. Iran supported that fully. If it was in Daesh movement toward Baghdad and the fall of Mosul, Maliki would have still ruled. And today, to protect him, they gave him a higher political position to be immune from any uh, uh, legal case. He, he hosts the vice president position there in the country. So in reality, everybody protected Maliki, did not really do. And if it wasn't Daesh really made that strong movement, huh? Matthew would still be, be there. Okay, uh, we can take some more questions. There's one in the middle here. Any questions in the back of the room that I'm not seeing? Okay, uh, first this one here, and then we'll take the questions further back. Uh, yes, I have just heard that, I don't remember, I think it's uh, one of the panelists, American policy is not clear and consistent. I'm sorry, could you also identify yourself? We'd like oh, to, yes. no, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm from Argentina, national defense expert, and also national defense, former NDU student. Um, my question is, I heard that American policy is not clear and consistent. So when the, when the United States was, began the war, they were, the United States was immersed in a kind of asymmetric war. Now again, they are trying to defeat this group through collisions, through unmanned devices. My question is, do you think that this kind of asymmetric strategies will lead to solution, or do you think that it's very far to obtain a good result with military force? Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll take some more questions. I see one at the very back of the room. 
My name is Nazila Fati. I was the New York Times correspondent in Tehran. Um, I don't want to disagree with uh, all the elements that um, were stated on this panel and on the previous panel. My question is about drought in the region. Uh, no one has referred to it as one of the reasons that is uh, contributing to the growth of the, uh, the sort of underclass that was mentioned. Uh, is this factor being ignored um, by the countries in the region, in Jordan, Marwan? I'm curious to know. Uh, agriculture and farming um, is, is becoming smaller. People are becoming economically unhappy. Um, is, is there anything that the governments can do and they're not doing it. In Iran, I know that um, the government doesn't pay attention. People don't pay attention until lakes and rivers completely disappear, and then it turns into a crisis. Uh, OK, yes, on water, drought. Uh, there was one more at the very back of the room. Yes, I had a question. I'm Shailene Daly. I work for the Department of Defense. So I'm here as a personal interest. My question was about Abdulaziz. You spoke about army. I believe you were referencing the Free Syrian Army and not the Assad regime. Um, assuming that we did go and arm them, we train them, we strengthen them, they suppressed ISIS and they overthrew the Assad regime. What guarantee do we have that they're not going to form their own government that's going to go and go along with that policy of exclusion that Marwan was speaking about? Okay. Uh, Marwan, perhaps let's begin with you this time to uh, address the water issue, uh, the drought issue, and whether this is a significant contributing factor to the, the uh, disillusionment and disenfranchisement. I mean, I, I haven't thought of it in terms of this kind of linking, but it certainly is a major issue uh, in the region in general and in, in Jordan in particular. Uh, just to give you uh, some statistics, uh, the, the, uh, the per capita share of water, uh, uh, if, it, if it drops below 400, uh, um, 400 cubic liters, I think, a year, something like this, uh, uh, then a country would be considered poor uh, uh, in terms of water resources. Jordan, uh, Jordan's share is 100. Okay, so it is way below what is considered uh, poor. Uh, and that is without the Syrian uh, refugee uh, issue. With the Syrian refugees, you have an additional, you know, whatever, 1.4, 1, whatever number of refugees. So you can understand the, 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 the extent of the problem. I'm not going to link it to ISIS because that's uh, a bit of a stretch. Uh, but it is one of the main problems uh, that... Uh, face the region with no solution. Uh, uh, I mean, for a country like Jordan, the only solution uh, is going to be uh, basically, well, two solutions. Uh, the country has to make a decision about whether to keep agricultural, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, activity or not. And if it doesn't, what does that mean to, you know, the uh, few hundred uh, thousand uh, of people who are living uh, fr off this? But the other uh, problem is that the long-term problem is desalination. In Jordan's uh, case, it requires a lot of energy uh, and, of course, res financial resources that Jordan simply does not have. So uh, basically, uh, people are waiting for the technology to be such that the, the cost will be lower. Uh, but uh, but uh, until that happens, uh, the country and the region will have to face uh, some very very serious uh, decision uh, decisions on this. Okay, uh, let me turn to Sony and Abdelaziz on these other questions about the whether the military approach will work, and what about let's say what if the Free Syrian Army were able to overthrow Bashar? What would happen? Oh, that's a possibility. We're, we're, we're uh, uh, hypothetical. No, the, the, que the first question was, can an asymmetric war be won? I think everybody in the previous panel and here basically said, you can contain uh, uh, the Islamic State. Perhaps you can give them great damage. You can damage them, but you cannot really totally root them out, and which is precisely my understanding of what the American policy was. That is, they would bomb and everybody else would fight. And the only ones who are actually willing to fight because they're defending themselves are the Kurds in Syria. And because the Free Syrian Army, I think, is a shell without much of a content, I think. 
And I guess in Iraq, that's the Iraqi army, the, the Peshmerge, and the, and the PKK, and that complicates matters f further. Uh, now, if, if you forgive me, if the Iranians were not invited, I'm sure it, it had other reasons than them not having good planes. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm honest to God, and I want to relate this to... I said they're part of the problem. <laughs> okay. And I, and I want to relate this to the issue of drought, because, I mean, we didn't mention drought because that was not... Uh, we, the, the debate was not about why we had this civil war. But, of course, the drought issue is going to become everywhere in the world a major national security issue. And these are really huge problems. And in order to deal with those things, you really need to have functioning governments. We don't have functioning governments. And before the geopolitical contest is settled, we will not have functioning governance. I will add, if you want, uh, some other very long-term and probably unsolvable uh, problem if we go along this path. What do we do with those millions of refugees? I really have, I, I, I don't think for a second that the two million refugees who are in Turkey, a big bulk of them are ever going to return. So what do we do with these people? Do you leave them like that so that they are the next generation of desperados, uh, especially when the, when the climate conditions worsen, governance problems worsen and stuff? And though that really requires a degree of international cooperation that we have not seen. Why? Because the essential power struggles have not yet been settled. And so long, if we, the longer we continue with that unsettled uh, political balance in the region, the more difficult it's going to be to actually tackle these problems. And that requires regional leadership and international leadership. Unfortunately, I, I fail to see their existence. Well, uh, just to comment on that, of course, I think having these millions of refugee countries like Lebanon today, they feel they are fighting war by proxy. You know, having millions of Syrians in Lebanon put a huge pressure on the facility, on the ability of a country like, small country like Lebanon to manage the issue there. Also Jordan, Turkey, I mean, it's a big problem. But again, don't forget, two million Iraqi moved from, from Al Mosul and the north part to, uh, to, to Kurdistan. So even within Iraq, we have mm -hmm. a refugee moving from south to north. So this is a real serious problem that needs to be addressed, and they're not addressed. The huge future consequences of that, only God knows. I think I'll go back to the question in Syria. Two years ago, I wrote an article saying, is a military transitional salvation council is an answer to the Syrian problem? In other words, what I'm saying, the one who supports Bashar to survive is his military establishment, plus Iran, plus Russia. Iran and Russia, they always stated, we will not die for Bashar al-Assad. Give us an alternative, we'll look at that one. But the question was, if we have that military salvation transitional council, could that be a solution? Could that be where this council con could consist of both, of the Free Syrian Army plus his existent one? What would they do? They can maintain they will be acceptable to maintain sort of law and order in the country. They still have bases and location in the country. They still can do a two years job to calm the country, to bring a little bit of stability, to encourage people to come back, to gradually reconstruct and build issues. And then Bashar can choose between the Danube in, uh, in Austria, a beautiful place uh, where he keep most of his money, or Algeria, or if they try to take him to, to, to a, a criminal court, it's up to them. But Always my concern was those people whom they fought and protected Assad never received an assurance that they would not be taken to a court or they would not be treated or, you know, they would not be taken to a criminal court and so And as long as it, they don't receive that, still they have the interest because his survival is their survival. So what we need to think is much more comprehensive solution, which include, uh, 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 you know, his part of his regime that have kept him survived, and, and the other home, they, you know, they, they really ask for the freedom. 
in no way, I mean, in no way he will gain. In both cases, he's a loser. If he stays, he cannot rule a country like, you know, more than the way how he's doing today and part of Damascus or, uh, you know, the larger Damascus that he's controlling. And on the, on the same time, somebody will argue, why do we need to interfere? Let Syria be a killing platform for everybody, for Hezbollah to interfere, you know, and then try to get rid of them uh, there for the Nusra, for the Daesh, for the, for the, for the you know, everybody, for the Syrian army. Let it be a killing platform. Uh, somebody argue that I disagree totally with that. I think from a humanitarian point of view, we should really work in a political solution where we can try to see, increase the pressure. The Assad, he doesn't feel any pressure today. He feel, well, fine, let Daesh and Nusra fight between them. Let the, uh, uh, you know, Kurd, the Bashmarga, and the Daesh still fight on, on the, on the uh, you know, Kobani, and I'm still there. Uh, we have time for just a couple of more questions. Uh, there's one gentleman in the last row who's been trying for a long time to get his question in. Hi, my, my name is Samar Chatterjee. Um, uh, this question I may direct it to Michelle, uh, the moderator, or others. Uh, the, the, you mentioned uh, the t terrorism under court, uh, and uh, but we never defined what it means, and I have to quote my mentor, Howard Zinn, who said, uh, we're fighting terrorism. Terrorism, uh, war is terrorism. What are we fighting? War is terrorism. So those who fight, and, and it was mentioned during discussion by Mr. Abdulaziz and also Soli, those who fight are the bad guys, okay? They should not be included. So the United States is always in the forefront of fighting war. So given that, aren't we also, as United States, the super terrorists? Uh, there's uh, this gentleman right here, I believe, had a question. Thank you. All right. Colonel Dave Seeley, retired Army. A uh, question to Admiral Aziz. Uh, just maybe you could talk to Saudi Arabia's uh, duplicitous role in, in terms of, in one hand, fighting ISIS, uh, a group whose ideology arguably is rooted back inside of the kingdom. And what more could Saudi do, if anything, to, to try to, to balance those two sides, uh, on the one hand, fighting this ideology, while on the other hand, spending millions of dollars to also support that ideology through schools worldwide, et cetera? Okay. And uh, a last question right here. Pete Hantoner from Turkish Press. I have a very quick question for Mr. Uh, uh Is there any way you can tell us how the relationship between Riyadh and Ankara these days, how the current administration, including Mr. Uh, President Erdogan, uh, is perceived by Riyadh? Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll, I'll start by addressing the, the question of the gentleman in the back. Um, you know, I, I think there, are, you know, there is a lot of controversy over the definition of terrorism. And it was in quotes here partly because, uh, uh, in, in the title of this panel, because of the differences in definition between the United, uh, among the United States and its coalition partners and between some of them. And I think we've already gotten to those issues a little bit about whether uh, um, er everyone knows there's something broader going on here than, uh, than ISIS, right? But the question is, uh, so there's this fear of radicalization and then people, you know, ba basically the, the definition of terrorism is normally people uh, using violence and usually using violence against civilians or non-combatants for political reasons. Uh, and so, um, you know, we've discussed a little bit, though, that, that uh, I mean, Soli was saying in the beginning that, that Turkey wants the PKK, you know, to be treated as a terrorist group and PYD as well, perhaps. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has been declared by not only Egypt, but also Saudi Arabia and I believe the Emirates as a terrorist group. So there's this, this issue of whether... Uh, uh, all groups who, uh, political Islamists, should somehow be considered part of the same problem or not. I, you know, it's, what's interesting is I asked the question at the beginning of the panel, is this going to be a big problem? Is it going to be something that's going to impede cooperation uh, between the United States and its allies or even among the allies? And I think what I've heard today is... Um, 
not so much that there are actually that there are even bigger issues than the definitional issue um, although the larger problem of radicalization and how that will be stemmed remains very much unresolved so let me give each of the uh, speakers just sort of one minute to address the last couple of questions I think we'll start with you Abdulaziz since there was a specific question for you about Saudi Arabia well, precisely when it comes to the issue, uh, uh, you know, on, on the Saudi-Turkish relation, I think I will start. I myself am I'm in full support of having a great relation between both sides. However, we agree in many issues and we disagree in some issues. We agree on the issue that Turkey presence in Iraq can offset the sphere's influence of Iran in Iraq. We agree that Turkey is extremely important in the Syrian issue. We agree on the issue, of course, of nuclear. Turkey is extremely important uh, on that uh, issue there in the region. Fighting terrorism, of course, it's a, it, it's a very common thing. So we have plenty of issues that we have. We are in agreement, great economic relation. But at the same time, I think Egypt is where we have the problem in that one. Turkey does not wish to accept the reality that CC in power, he is there, military, you know, are in position. They don't wish to see that repeated. I mean, I can understand President Erdogan, you know, position. He does not wish to see a strong military. Uh, he called it coup d'etat. We call it people wishes in, in, in Egypt to be uh, uh, repeated in a country like Turkey. I think my feeling that Turkey will, you know, reality will settle down. Or, you know, the Americans say reality will sink down. So it will, you know, we're going to see that you know, uh, 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 reality in the relation between both sides will take, you know, place much sooner than later. Uh, the Amir of Qatar, you know, in his last visit, uh, you know, to Saudi Arabia, uh, through a friend of mine, I believe he brought up the issue of strengthening the relation again between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Saudi has no, uh, nothing against having a good relation, of course, with Turkey, but they wish to see less tension between Turkey and Egypt. Egypt is an important alliance for us in the region. I think having a triangle, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, can really do a great things you know, in many uh, of the region and bringing a great, a great security. Your question, sir, I think was uh, 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 with regard to Saudi, you know, having to fight both. Yes, uh, we are the hub of the Arab, we are the Arabian Peninsula, we are uh, Mecca and Medina is there, so 1.5 billion Muslims look towards Saudi Arabia. We have to maintain, uh, you, know, you know, being the leader of the Islam, but at the same time, we have accepted the eighth sect of uh, Islam in the big conference in Mecca and the OIC. So moderate Islam in Saudi Arabia, it exists. We are not a fanatic. And by the way, monarch is more about liberalism and not conservatism. They wish to see power transformed to their kids and sons and, and, and family. So they would like, they're quick in reforms because they, want, they can do it much quicker because they would like to stay in power. And, and at the same time, we understand extremism and we have to fight extremism. I think Saudi Arabia have proven to be a very strong defender. When we came up with the initiative of a global center in fighting terrorism and Saudi donated hundreds of millions of dollars in support of that under the United Nations, it was our great intention to have a global cooperation in fighting terrorism, extremism. This is something we suffer from. We have been fighting and we will continue to fight it. I'll refer to what you just said, and that is the definition of terrorism, of course, itself is a very political thing. That's why you have all these problems of not agreeing on definitions because there are political differences. I'd like to conclude with uh, Turkish-American relations, which I think are Turkey's paramount relations. And those relations, in my view, have been shaken somewhat in the last few months. Uh, partially because there are ideological divergences, especially vis-a-vis -vis our topic, that is what to do with IS and what, what the best course to follow is. Uh, and uh, I think it is worth the while of both countries to actually try to figure out how exactly they should redefine their lines of communication because a lot is at stake there if those relations go bad, in my view. Uh, thank you, Soli. Uh, Marwan has, has uh, ceded his final comments in, in favor of letting you get to lunch, which uh, is, is a buffet that is served uh, outside here. So uh, please, following this session, just get your lunch and come back in and have a seat. We'll be beginning the next section in 30 minutes. But before we do that, please join me in thanking Soli Azul, Abdul Isagar, Marwan Marshall.